The gospel is a book. It's a book written for a particular people at a particular time in history with a particular purpose. And if we can go back and find out for whom the book was written, we can find and relate to those deep truths that are in the gospel. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to begin with hearing about who the gospel was written for, the gospel of Matthew. Bible st scholars tell us that the Gospel of Matthew was written between 75 and 100 of the Common Era. It was written after the Jesus event. It was written after Nero burnt Christ followers on the stakes just to illuminate his evening games. It was written after the destruction of Jerusalem, when the center, the core of the Jewish faith and the core of the Christ followers was totally demolished. And so we find the people of faith have spread right throughout the whole area of the Mediterranean. And the same time as they've been spreading out, they've also been gathering together into enclaves of the cities like Antioch so that they can gather together for mutual um, support to survive those very frightening and turbulent times. The book of Matthew was written for a small group of Jews called out from the greater Jewish community because they followed Jesus. You know, what we call the Christian church just didn't exist yet. Even the term Christian didn't exist yet. So this book was written to help this particular group of people form their Christ following or their Christian identity. I keep saying small group because it was a small group. They estimate that there was only one home church group of people. So that makes it between 25 and 40 people in that community. This is just like us, a small group of people called out from the greater area to become disciples of Christ. They are people out of step with the world around them. Now the Romans accepted people bowing down to any god, as long as they also bowed down to the emperor. But the Jewish people worshipped only one god, they worshipped Yahweh, and they did not bow down to any human beings. And so they suffered for their belief. And the Christ followers, following Jews were even more ostracized because they associated with that rebel Jew, Jesus. They were out of step with both their Jewish community and the whole of the Roman Empire. So Matthew wrote to teach them about that being out of step was actually good news. That following the alternate path of God as revealed in Jesus was the best way. Our times are turbulent too. I read the newspapers like you all do. There is a huge drought and famine. Over 12 million people are suffering. Parents are walking and arriving by the thousands at the relief centers carrying their rag doll children. Aid workers there are overwhelmed by the situation. Our own government here in the USA just struggled to balance the, the debt and the budget. And just when they thought they had their act together and maybe the markets would regain some stability, the news came from overseas that the market theirs were in trouble and our markets fell and we lost all the earnings for a whole year. Also, in the United States, we have over 9% of unemployment. People who are work, looking for work are now celebrating anniversaries of unemployment. On a personal note, a very personal note, your little church has changed pastors. You're facing expensive renovations on our parsonage so that we can put it to a new ministry. Our congregation has been shrinking over the last few years. Choir robes sit unused, hanging in the closet. We don't have a functioning nursery. We haven't really even confirmed who's going to teach Sunday school to our children. Because you know you need two adults in that room with our children. We are just a small group of people called to live as disciples in this frightening and turbulent time. Now Matthew tells this story of this particular
particular event in Jesus' time to teach the Christ followers of Antioch that God has been active in their history, that God continues to care for them, and that we can understand, or that they can understand, God's purposes through Jesus. Last week in church, we learned that when Jesus had heard of John, his beloved cousin's horrible death, that he tried to go away and have time to grieve and pray. But the, as all the other people in the community also heard this news, they began to gather until there's thousands and thousands on the Sea of Galilee. And, and Jesus had met their needs. And with the help of the disciples, he fed them. And then, then we come to this part of the story that we're reading this week. It's the same day that all this other has occurred, and night is drawing near. So immediately, he made the disciples get in the boat, and he dismissed the crowd. He goes up to the mountain to finally have that time to pray. He sent the disciples on ahead to Genesaret, the other side of the lake, because there were people there that needed to be ministered to. But he needed time apart before he could join them. He needed to be in the healing presence of God. He needed to turn to God the Father for compassion, for comfort, for restoration from his grief. We too need to set time apart daily to be with God, to have God's healing compassion in our times of trouble. Now, while Jesus was praying, the disciples were in the boat trying to get to the other side. The lake's not that wide. It's only about seven miles from Bethesda to Genesaret. But they hadn't made much process. They'd been in that boat all night. It was a dark night. The wind was against them. The waves were huge. They had tried to follow Jesus' instructions, but they were to no excess. Maybe they had cried out. We read the song. Jean read the song. Maybe they had cried out to God, but the Bible doesn't say. It just says they struggled. Matthew chose this story to tell because the people of Antioch also lived in a coastal city, and they understood the terrors of the sea, and they would also have understood the hidden symbolism in this story. Boats are a symbol for Christ followers. So the command to get in the boat is like the command to get in the boat of Christianity, even if the sailing is turbulent and frightening. They could also connect to the next part of the story, the demonstration of faith and the revelation of Jesus' love and divine power. During the fourth watch, which was between the hours of 3 and 6 o'clock in the morning, Jesus just came striding across that water, the disciples, already weary and fearful, they, they yell out, It's a ghost! But Jesus says, Courage! It is I! Don't be afraid! One biblical scholar has counted it up in the Bible. There's over 366. Do not be afraid! Courage! It is I! Do not be afraid! And Peter, always the ever hopeful, the first to react, he says, If it's you, tell me to come to you. And Jesus says, Come! And Peter just leaps out of the boat. Thank God for the Peters in our life. Those who want to follow Jesus so closely that they just run to meet him. Those who think outside of the box, or at least outside of the boat. The Peters among us haven't learned what can't be done yet. And God sends us Peters in, in unusual people and places, in the voices of strangers, or the crystal clear voice of children. We admire the impulsive audacity of Peter. And yet, soon as Peter takes a step out of that boat, and he takes his eyes off Jesus and looks around at the wind and the water, he begins to sink. The scene reminds me of Wile E. Coyote in the Roadrunner cartoon. You know, the Roadrunner just zips off that mezza right across the open canyon onto the next mezza. Wile E. Coyote follows him at high speeds, gets out over the canyon, looks down, sees nothing underneath him, and falls. Poof! Peter falls, but he has the common sense to cry out, Save me! 
And immediately Jesus reaches out and saves Peter. And they both get in the boat. And the winds and the waves calm. And they're able to sail the boat to Genesaret to minister to the people there. And the disciples worshipped Jesus, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. <clears throat> this is not the first time that Jesus has calmed the wind and the waves. This is in chapter 14. In chapter 8, they're out on a boat, same sea, big storms. Jesus is having a nap. And they wake him up and they say, save us. And he gets up and he rebukes the wind and the wave. And they're able to sail to their destination. His, his, um, at that point, they say, what manner of man is this? Because they still don't get it. But now they've encountered Jesus in a new, surprising, extraordinary, even miraculous way. He has walked across the water to save them. He has lifted Peter right out of the briny cold. And now they recognize his divine power. And they say, truly, you are the Son of God. The passage of scripture teaches us that God loves us, responds to our cries for salvation. Out of love, Jesus marched across the waves to be with them. And he calmed the sea so they could sail on and do ministry. His saving grace immediately met their needs so they could continue to be a means of grace for others. Peter's part in the story shows us the relationship between belief and fear. Because we humans are human and we vacillate back and forth. Faith isn't something that we just possess. Okay, we live in America, we like to possess things. But faith isn't something we just possess. It isn't settled once and for all. Reverend Hare, a biblical commentator, says faith is an activity. It's more like a song that disappears when you stop singing. But we are called to be faithful, to keep on singing. When we look away from Jesus and we see the wind and the waves, or we see drought and famine, or we see a weak economy, or we see anger in a relationships that are dissolving, or we see big changes in our church, fear overcomes us. And paralyzed by fear, we begin to sink until we cry out, save us. And immediately, Jesus will reach out and draw us back into the boat. Also, Jesus doesn't call all of us to get out of the boat. Lots of good disciples stayed in the boat. Some, like Peter, are more willing to take big steps, big risks. That's fine. But some of us are called to take smaller steps, smaller risks. We're called to ordinary steps that are vital to God's kingdom. This part of the church is called the nave. The nave is an old Latin term for ship. We are God's ship, and we're not meant to be stationary. We are called to minister, to exercise our faith, to keep singing, and to do little things for our great God. Things like supporting the relief, Africa, relief efforts in Africa, Helping students from families suffering through unemployment and economic downturn get ready for school by providing backpacks full of school supplies. Or even working on church finances, printing bulletins, delivering flyers so that others are invited into our part of the church. And get in that boat knowing that God will provide a way to ride out the storms and get us to God's destination. We are called to be a means of grace in the world, a people through whom God, God's love can serve the world. Matthew wrote this gospel to help the people of Antioch ride out the storms of life. But it continues to help us today by teaching us that God has been active in our history, that God continues to care for us, and that God's purpose and love are made clear through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus.
Amen.